Hello everyone, and welcome back to Dragalia Foundry, a fan channel where everything Dragalia Lost can be found. Today's video is going to be my review of the new Summon Showcase, Eastern Emissaries, which lasts from today, December 31st, until January 9th. Now this is actually a limited time showcase, meaning that certain adventurers, dragons, and worm prints are only going to be available on this showcase and possible reruns in the future. They won't be added to the normal summoning pool after this showcase ends. So just like Dragon Yule Defenders, that means this is probably going to be your only chance to pick up some of these characters for quite a while. Now Eastern Emissaries is all about the new year and a new continent that is discussed in the corresponding raid event, Hinamoto. So it's exciting to see we get some new characters from there, we get a new dragon and some new worm prints with really pretty artwork, but we're going to get into all of that today. As always, with a new showcase comes a new giveaway, so the link to the Gleam giveaway is in the description below. On screen now are the timestamps if you wish to skip ahead, and we are dealing with a new mechanic on this showcase as well. The details are a little bit scant at this point, except in Japanese, but basically this is a new affliction, and I'll talk a bit more about it when we get to the adventurers, all of whom interact with it. So without further ado, let's get into our first worm print. At 3 star, we have Vio Rise Alberia. Now this is one of two worm prints which are actually going to be part of the normal summoning pool, so if you really wanted this, it isn't going to be limited like some of the other New Year's items. That said, I can't imagine you really wanting this. Vio Rise Alberia has Slayer Strength as an ability, and that is rare. It's only found on Unfulfilled Visions, a 3 star worm print which is basically identical to Vio Rise Alberia. It is kind of similar as well to Together We Stand, which has Striker Strength, the difference being that Striker Strength requires you to defeat enemies with 4 strikes in order to actually receive the benefit of that. In the end, I think that the low stats of this worm print, being a natural 3 star, and how demanding Slayer's strength is, requiring a map with lots of enemies, mean this is one you probably just want to sell for Eldwater. Moving on from there, we come to King's Countenance. This was a very popular worm print for quite a while because of its shapeshift prep ability. That is very useful in a lot of raid contexts, or at least it has been, where there's an epithet or title to be gained by defeating the raid boss within a certain time limit. Now the other ability, Curse Res, is kind of nice on King's Countenance, at least in that it goes up to 25%, so that can be used to top off the remaining 25% on, say, a natural 3-star Light Adventurer, whose Curse Res only goes up to 75%. Ultimately though, I think the other two options I've listed here, Dragon Arcanum and Dragon's Nest, are perfectly fine if your main use for this is to go for raid clears. The other wrinkle to this is that this most recent raid that started today actually has a different condition for getting the epithet. And I think this is probably a one-of or an occasional thing, and it has to do with the fact that the raid boss drops gifts, so they don't want to incentivize players to defeat it before they've collected those. That's why I think they don't want to go with a time limit this time around. So I do see shapeshift prep and that meta, that strategy for taking on raid bosses quickly, still being viable in the future. Ultimately, I do think King's Countenance is good for for that reason. It's not one that you should necessarily try to summon for, but it is nice to pick up a few of and hang on to. Now we get into our first limited time worm print, and this is Hanatsuki Rally. So Hanatsuki Rally has the abilities last offense and critical rate, and its stats are pretty offensively skewed. The highest attack or strength on a 4 star worm print is 52, and so this has 51. It's right up there with One with the Shadows and Happier Times. One with the Shadows is one of the comparisons I make because that's actually going to provide more amount of critical rates and a very useful secondary ability, Broken Punisher. Now Warlust I've also listed because that also provides last offense, but then it comes with the secondary ability of skill damage. In my opinion, one or the other of Warlust or One with the Shadows are probably going to be better than Hanatsuki Rally. I think the main appeal of this worm print is is the artwork, the New Year's outfits. That is really cool to see, it's really fun. Luca being a prankster as usual, but I just don't see a whole lot of synergy here with last offense and critical rates. Last offense in general, I'm not huge on as an ability. It is nice on squishier attackers who have low HP. So think of someone like Celiera. There are actually a number of blade units who kind of fit into that category. But ultimately, I see one with the shadows as probably the best among these. Then Warlust if you're using a unit with two attacking skills. And finally, 
Hanatsuki Rally a ways down from both of those two. After Hanatsuki Rally though, we get to the first 5 star worm print that's featured on this showcase, and this is, right on theme, Happy New Year. So this is another worm print that has an ability that's locked to a specific type of adventurer, in this case Paralysis Res, which is only given to shadow adventurers who equip the worm print. Anyone who equips it will get that light res though, and it's pretty high, starting at 8% and going all the way up to 10% once this is max unbound. Now I've listed 4 stars as comparisons because I feel like both of these are just fine for the purpose of Paralysis Res, and so even though they don't have the stats of Happy New Year, I think they're enough to get the job done, and it's why I don't see Happy New Year as being a great worm print ultimately. So Castaway's Journal, you can get up to 25% Paralysis Res from that, and up to 5% Light Res once it's max unbound, and then Luck of the Draw is a free worm print, so the stats are lower, it's given out from the new raid event, and it has Paralysis Res up to 20%, and then Shadow Buff Time up to 20%. Now that isn't up to 25% paralysis res, and of course the stats are weaker, but what I mean to say here is that I think both of these are serviceable enough. You don't really need Happy New Year, except that that unbound artwork is so good. The whole main cast is there, even Zethia in the background. I suppose Mim is missing, which is a little disappointing, but that would be the main reason I would recommend this worm print, is if you are a collector, that artwork is amazing. Moving on from there though, we come to the final worm print on the showcase, the other featured 5 star, Heralds of Hinamoto, and this is a good worm print. Its first ability is skill damage of 20 or 25% once max unbound, and the second ability is skill haste of 2 or 5%. The stats are offensively skewed, they're identical to those on Resounding Rendition, and the first ability is identical to both Plunder Pals and Resounding Rendition. So ultimately I think that the benefit of this worm print will really come down to whether you were playing during Halloween and were able to max out your plunder pals, because if you have that max unbound, that is kind of going to be good enough. The stats are weaker, there's no secondary ability, but this doesn't fill a role that plunder pals doesn't do a fine job of already. For really hard content like high dragon trials, you're never going to use either of these worm prints, so the most common use cases are for things like raids, things like imperial onslaught that you're doing on a daily basis, and in those situations I can't imagine that skill haste ability, marginal at best, really making a huge difference. Now if you are able to max unbind this, it's definitely better than Plunder Pals, it's pretty much strictly better, just like Resounding Rendition was. But I just don't think this does enough new that it's super desirable to summon, you'd be happy with any copies you pick up, but it's not a reason to pull on its own. If I had to compare it to Resounding Rendition, it would be tough, I would want to check the exact cutoffs on Skill Haste, but I have to say I think that probably the critical effect on Resounding Rendition will generally be a bit better, unless you're stacking Heralds of Hinamoto with a very high co-ability Archer, and using a unit with quick to charge skills like a sword unit, then I think that Heralds of Hinamoto starts to look better. Alright, so looking at the Worm Prince as a whole, I definitely think the 3 star, Hanatsuki Rally and the Happy New Year Worm Print are probably the weakest among them. Now we come to dragons and our first dragon is Silk. So Silk is the final thing on the showcase that is part of the normal summoning pool, along with Vio Rice Alberia and King's Countenance. So this won't be your only chance at getting Silk, but she is a rate up since she's featured here, and Silk is a pretty good 4 star dragon. She is a mixed dragon, so she provides both strength and HP of 15 or 20% to shadow adventurers depending on her unbinding, and the really nice thing about her skill is that it decreases enemy defense by 10 or 15% for 10 seconds. That can be really helpful for adventurers who have trouble getting in damage. If you're able to utilize this while the enemy is broken, you can start to stack up a lot of damage. However, there are two other mixed options for shadow dragons. So Maridi came from the Resplendent Refrain raid event, and he only provides 10 or 15%, but he was free and it was possible to max unbind him. So just for comparison's sake, I have my own Maridi at level 50, and my Silk, who I only have one copy of, is at level 30. And at those levels, Silk actually provides more stats. So that should give you a sense that Maridi can be made better by leveling him up, but he has to be quite a bit higher level than Silk in order to actually provide those benefits. 
So generally speaking, you could technically make a Maridi whose max unbounds better than a Silk who's been unbound twice, but you're gonna basically need to level him up almost to his maximum. And once you get to three unbindings on your Silk or fully unbounds, there's no way Maridi will be able to catch up. So Silk is still powerful despite being a four star, even if you have Maridi. Now the comparison is less favorable to Nidhogg. Nidhogg is sort of just downright more powerful than Silk, providing higher percentages to both HP and strength strength and with higher stats, but of course Nidhogg is a gacha 5 star, so you may or may not have him, in which case Silk is a pretty good dragon and great to round up a shadow team. After Silk, we come to another limited unit. This is the 5 star focus dragon and it's Marishi Ten. Marishi Ten utilizes the new mechanic I alluded to earlier. It's the Affliction Bleeding, which from what I can tell so far, has a similar effect to Poison and Burn. Perhaps the actual amounts of damage are lower, but it can be stacked up to three times on a single target. And with every stack, the amount of damage taken starts to increase. So Marishi Ten's skill Daybreak Flurry in Flicks bleeding, and besides all of that, perhaps the most appealing thing about her is that she is the first 5 star shadow dragon who purely boosts strength by 40 or 60%. So this is a really high stat increase, it's what you see on Cerberus, Agni, Leviathan, Sephir, Cupid, and that by itself is going to make her quite powerful. She is going to give you the most strength you can get of any shadow dragon currently available in the game. When you consider the fact as well that she is a event exclusive or time limited dragon, she is probably a great investment for your sunlight or if you start to spend your sunlight stones and unbind her, you don't have to worry that you'll get extra copies in the future and have wasted those stones because she's not going to be in the normal summoning pool. Having said all of that, of course, I do think that it's worth considering Juggernaut. Juggernaut is a four star shadow dragon and he holds his own, especially if you've been able to max unbind him. In that case, his percentage boost to strength is going to be higher than what you get from Rishi Ten until you max unbind her. Now Nidhogg is also worth comparing, and especially when you think about the end game content, a lot of adventurers, particularly ranged ones, even though they may want strength, and this is hypothetical, but when it comes to high dragons, what we've seen with High Brunhilde is you sometimes just have to run a dragon that boosts your HP, otherwise you won't be able to survive. So that's why I still give some credit to Nidhogg here and say Rishi Ten may not be the only option. This is all hypothetical, of course, but say if you're bringing someone like Nefaria into High Jupiter one day, you might actually need your Nidhogg and not your Marishi Ten. So overall, definitely a powerful dragon, but I do want to provide that one caveat and that one thing to think about. Ultimately, I would say that both dragons are hits on this showcase. I think I'd be happy with summoning either of them, and I think to round out a team, they are great shadow dragons. But moving on from there, we finally come to the adventurers, and we're going to start things off with the first focus four star, Adis. Now, as with Marishi Ten, all of these adventurers are going to be limited to this New Year's showcase, so do keep that in mind. Adis is a wind blade attacker with pretty high stats actually higher than Musashi, who is another 4-star Wind Blade. Their co-ability is identical, of course. Their first skill also inflicts wind damage ahead and poisons enemies, just with a different hit pattern. And Adisa's second skill, Dignified Soul, much like Musashi's Force of the Wind, increases the user's strength. The big difference here is that Adis gets 10 seconds, but lower percentage buffs, whereas Musashi only gets 5 seconds, but higher percentages on their strength. However, Adisa's skill has a secondary effect as well, and that is that while Dignified Soul is active, Bamboo Cutter will inflict bleeding instead of poison. Now this synergizes with Adisa's first ability, Bleeding Punisher, where he'll do more damage to bleeding foes by 5 or 8%, depending on how much you've upgraded that. Adiz also has Freeze Res, which nicely differentiates him from Musashi, but does put him in the same company as Melody, giving her a bit more competition than she had before. And then Adiz's final ability, if you promote him to a 5 star, is Broken Punisher of 20%. So Adiz definitely looks like a very powerful unit. He would definitely be great for something like Water Imperial Onslaught with that Freeze Res, and hopefully not a lot of bosses will be able to resist bleeding in order to utilize him to the fullest. Now in terms of build ideas for Adis, for Worm Prince, I think that Deese really wants to cycle through his skills as quickly as possible. So I've chosen Worm Prince here with skill prep, starting with a slice of Dragon Yule as the budget pick, since that was available during the last facility event for free. Worthy Rivals is the more expensive option, 
but it provides another Broken Punisher ability to Adis, which will stack with his own if you've made him into a 5 star. As far as dragons go, I think that Adis wants to have strength oriented dragons, so Rock and Zephyr are the natural choices there. Next, for teammates, I've decided to capitalize on the fact that Adis wants to have his enemies be bleeding, so both Botan and Sasanka have first skills which inflict bleeding, and that means that those skills charge relatively quickly. And unlike Ieyasu, neither of them shares a weapon type with Adis, so they aren't overlapping in co-ability whatsoever. The other nice thing is, since these are both shadow adventurers, they can come into, say, water maps and not have an inherent weakness. Now for weapons, I don't think there's necessarily a standout to use here. The 4-star Windsblade only increases Adisa's own defense, so unless you're stacking that with a healing or strength double buff worm print, it doesn't seem to be super good. Crimson Shade, on the other hand, can eventually be enhanced into the 5-star Elemental Windblade, and this does provide Adis another attacking skill. As a natural attacker, I do think that is probably the preferred option. Overall, it seems that we have a very powerful adventurer here. Adiz will certainly scale in strength depending on the availability of future characters, especially wind ones, who can inflict bleeding just like he does. But even at his base, Adiz has just plain higher stats than Musashi. Thankfully, Musashi has bog res and not freeze res, so they're not outright competitors in that sense, but Adiz is a pretty strong unit and one I'd be happy to summon. Moving on from Adis though, we get to the second featured unit on the showcase, Sazanka. She is a Shadow Axe defense unit, with that defense co-ability being an axe wielder, and a stat spread that skews much more heavily toward HP being a defense type. Her first skill, Dancing Blossoms, does quite a lot. It deals shadow damage, draws in surrounding enemies, and inflicts bleeding on them. This is a very powerful skill for a tank like Sazanka since she's likely to be able to outlast her foes while they're affected by that bleeding condition. Her second skill is also very powerful, Blooming Cradle, however it is one you'll want to control her in order to actually utilize since it relies on force strikes. Once Blooming Cradle has been activated, for the next three force strikes, Sazanka will deal extra damage and inflict sleep on foes hit by those force strikes. This is really powerful, sleep is a very debilitating condition, so unlike the blindness inflicted by a similar skill on Vita, I think that this one will increase the longevity of Sazanka quite substantially. Now the ultimate power of this skill will depend on how many enemies, and especially bosses, naturally resist sleep, but I can imagine this being very useful for crowd control as well. And overall, looking at the rest of Sasanka's kit, just like a D, she seems quite powerful. It's almost as though these characters were built as 5 stars with how synergistic some of their abilities are. She's the only other character besides Halloween El San, for instance, to have Gage Accelerator, although her percentages are slightly lower, but this is a very strong ability that allows you to break bosses more quickly. Then Sasanka has Paralysis Res, which works well for the current raid event, and potentially for High Jupiter, if the trend continues with High Brunhilde and High Midgard Swarmer, afflicting the same conditions as their normal counterparts. Finally, Sazanka has Sleeping Punisher, and that's just going to increase damage to those foes she's able to hit with her Blooming Cradle. The only other two adventurers who can inflict sleep right now are Vice and Klyman. Both of them resist Blind instead of Paralysis, so they may not be the best teammates for Sazanka in that sense. Last up, before moving on to builds, there is one other Shadow Axe in the game, and that is Eric. Eric is a 3-star, and his total stats are definitely quite a bit lower than Sazanka's, but as an attack type, he actually has more strength than she does. And with two attacking skills, I don't think he outright is outclassed by her, especially since he has Blindness Res and a useful first ability in extra 4-strike damage. Now as far as building Sazanka, my ideas are actually quite similar to those with Adis. So for Worm Prince, I've listed the same too. And my thinking here is that for adventurers who don't have two attacking skills or don't have two healing skills, skill prep is a pretty good medium. The other nice thing about Worthy Rivals is, since Sazanka has Gage Accelerator, she'll be able to break bosses more quickly and utilize the Broken Punisher as the secondary ability on that Worm Prince. 
For dragons, I've chosen Silk and Nidhogg, although you could use Strength Dragons with Sazanka as well, but I think as a tank she benefits from having access to both stats, it's going to increase her survivability, and both Silk and Nidhogg have nice secondary effects on their skills. Silk is going to debuff enemy defense as we talked about earlier, and Nidhogg is going to blind enemies, which combined with Sazanka's sleep is going to make it very difficult for them to deal damage to her. For teammates, it's probably no surprise, but I think you could play up the bleeding on Sazanka's first skill with Botan, who was mentioned earlier, and Ieyasu since, unlike Adis, he is another shadow adventurer, and together with Botan, they all have paralysis res. So these three together I think make a very potent team. Ieyasu himself has a second skill which wants enemies to be bleeding, so I think these are really perfect teammates. Finally, for weapons for Sazanka, Crater's Despair is a 4-star Shadow Axe which has an attacking skill. Meanwhile, the 5-star Halfling's Broad Axe increases the user's critical damage and it can be enhanced into the 5-star Shadow Axe eventually. Personally, I like the 4-star a bit better here since Sazanka doesn't have anything inherent to her kit that depends on critical rates or critical damage. Ultimately, Sazanka strikes me as a very powerful unit, but I do wonder about her endgame performance since her kit depends on two stats status conditions, bleeding and sleep. So for something like High Jupiter, despite having a great gauge accelerator, a great resistance potentially with paralysis res, and generally high stats, a defense up co-ability, pretty much everything you would want in an adventurer, I do worry that the fact that her first two skills depend so much on status conditions, she may not be up to par there, but for the vast majority of the content in the game, she seems like an amazing unit. Okay, and we finally come to the last adventure featured on this showcase. Ieyasu is the Focus 5 star, he is a Shadow Blade attack unit, and at 521 max strength, he is the strongest adventurer currently in the game in terms of pure stats. He even has an extra point on Mikoto and the same co ability, so as a 5 star blade and only the second one, he is quite powerful. Sakura Flurry, his first skill, deals shadow damage and inflicts bleeding to foes directly ahead, while Blade Formation, Ieyasu's second skill, gives him a buff for 15 seconds that slowly heals him and increases his critical rate versus bleeding foes. Now this works perfectly with his first ability, which increases his critical rate when his HP is above 70%, so the healing will combine to hopefully keep him above that threshold, and once blade formation is active, you're looking at potentially a 25% critical rate buff just from that in combination with blade formation. Then he has paralysis res, which is pretty standard, it's the same thing that we saw on Sazanka, and his third ability critical damage of 15 or 20% works perfectly with the rest of his kit. So Ieyasu seems like a very cohesive unit and a very powerful one. His only competition in the Shadow Pool is Taro, Taro being the only other Shadow Blade unit, but if you just look at the stats of Taro and the co-ability, it's a pretty distant comparison. Now I will say that the one redeeming thing about Taro is that he has two attacking skills and they do a fair amount of damage, but really the last defense, the lower amount of paralysis res, if you get Ieyasu, he is generally going to be a superior choice. Now as far as builds go for Ieyasu, I definitely think you want to play up that critical aspect to his character. So for sure, the best worm print in my mind is Levin's Champion to give you even more critical rate and even more critical damage. And if you don't have that though, a fine substitute for the time being, a recent free worm prints we got, would be Luck of the Draw. The particular thing I like about Luck of the Draw, since the Paralysis Res is irrelevant for Ieyasu, is that it provides Shadow buff time. So that's going to increase the duration of Ieyasu's Blade Formation, allowing him to keep healing and have a higher critical rate against his bleeding foes. For Dragons, as an attacker, I definitely think you want to look at Juggernaut or Marishi Ten. Marishi Ten being the ultimate choice for Ieyasu, it's his canonical companion, and because Marishi Ten inflicts bleeding, it just works perfectly well with Ieyasu's kit. For teammates, I think Botan and Sazanka, who have already been mentioned several times, make the most sense. It is a bit disappointing that Sazanka can't use her second skill because it depends on Force Strikes, but I still think the fact that both Botan and Sazanka's 
burst skills inflict bleeding, make them great picks. You could also consider running a powerful dagger units like Orion alongside Ieyasu, just because any extra critical rate from a co ability will be highly valued. And finally, for weapons, Gizlam's Dark Blade increases Ieyasu's own defense, so this is nice if you want to run something like a Wish Upon the Yule Tree and take advantage of the healing double buff and extra defense from that. But otherwise, I do think Soul Eater is ultimately the better choice. Soul Eater can be enhanced into the 5 star Shadow Blade, and it provides Ieyasu with another attacking skill. Alright, and that brings us to the end of the showcase. All in all, I think this is a pretty powerful one. Shadow is inherently stronger as an element alongside Light because it has no weakness. In the end, I would rate Eastern Emissaries a 7 out of 10 though because some of the Worm Prints do drag it down just a little bit. The featured 3-star Vile Rise Alberia and Hanatsuki Rally aren't the greatest to summon, and less commonly but still relevant at 5-star, that Happy New Year Worm Print despite its amazing artwork just doesn't seem to have very many applications, and it is pretty narrow with one of its abilities only working on Shadow Adventurers. So if any of the adventurers appeal to you, I would suggest potentially summoning for those, especially since the 4 stars you are likely to be able to pick up. A lot of the power of those 4 stars will depend on how much of bleeding we see in the future, whether bleeding is able to be afflicted upon bosses in particular. It seems to have worked on the raid boss at the very least, so we're going to have to wait and see on how all of that shakes out. But in the end, as a limited showcase, if you're a collector or if you just like the aesthetic of these characters, this is a pretty good showcase to pick them up. Not the greatest we've seen for endgame content necessarily, but still quite good nonetheless, and I can imagine someone like Ieyasu and potentially Sazanka even being relevant for future battles against someone like High Jupiter. Definitely let me know what you think of the showcase, whether you've summoned, whether you plan to summon, and who you've gotten if you did so. As always, I do these review videos based on theory, based on my impressions and my knowledge of the game, ahead of trying out the units, so do take what I say with a grain of salt. It's for that reason that I'd love to hear about your personal experience, whether you've tried out any of these units, whether you agree or disagree with my initial impressions, whatever it is, leave it in the comments below. Having just gotten back from vacation, there is a ton more content coming out this week. I think you've probably noticed I've been trying to get out videos as quickly as I can since I have a lot stockpiled up. As for what you can look forward to, I will probably summon on this showcase right away, at least for a small amount. It being a limited showcase and Shadow being one of my weakest elements. After that, you can expect some gameplay and some thoughts on the event itself. And I will finally get out my Water Squad showcase reviewing all your teams. I know that has taken quite a while with your 60 submissions, but I am going to get through that this week, so please stay tuned. Otherwise, everyone, thank you so much for watching. Take care, and I'll see you next time.